My name is Matt Crandall. I'm with Automation Control Products. Today's presentation is going to be on the new Thin Manager 7.0 XLI product technology, as well as the Relevance 1.0 mobility product technology. This presentation is going to be broken up into really four different sections. I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation briefly in front of a full demo of 7.0. And then I'm going to do a second PowerPoint presentation on the theory of mobility and relevance. And then I'll do an actual product de demonstration of relevance 1.0. I'm going to start out by talking about the new release of uh, Thin Manager 7.0. This particular version was two years in the making. It has a brand new interface. It began shipping uh, on the 10th of March. It is an upgrade, if you're a platform maintenance user, it is an upgrade to the 6.0 product. You don't have to pay any extra, it'll come to you in the mail, you'll be able to upgrade from 6.0 to 7.0. It also, if you're purchasing it brand new, has the same purchase price as 6.0. The significant change in the interface, well it's broken into a bunch of different items. Um, if you're familiar with Excel, uh, we've added what's called a ribbon bar across the top if you select the menu items. You get different icons across the top to select your uh, function from. We've uh, created a Thin Manager tree toolbar on the left hand side, similar to what you'd see in Outlook. So if you're familiar with the Outlook toolbar on the left hand side of the screen, we've taken the Thin Manager tree and we've broken it up into segments. So you'll have the Thin Server segment, you'll have the uh, Terminal segment, you'll have the Display Server segment, you'll have the Display Client segment, you'll have the User or Term Secure User segment, and then you'll have the VMware virtualization segment. If you're a relevance user, you also get a new segment that's called locations. When you're touching one of the items in the toolbar tree, that's where you'll be able to work with the menu items and change the functions or, or touch the functions across the top in the uh, ribbon bar. When you're touching an item in the toolbar tree, you'll also get on the right hand side a set of tabs for things like configuration information, modules information, uh, reporting information or shadowing and you're able to now tear those tabs away so we've got tear away tabs in this new version the tabs can either be torn away and put somewhere else on the same screen you're on or on a different monitor or you can actually dock them within the Thin Manager interface we've also got what we call the quick access toolbar across the top on the menu area where you can quickly get to a function like restarting a terminal or sending a calibration command to a terminal we've also got a customizable layout that I'll talk to you about or demonstrate when I show the product where you can change the look and feel of the interface as well as the tab designs. So what I want to do first, I actually want to go through a presentation of the product technology with my setup here and I want to talk about the setup before I get started so that you'll fully understand what it is I'm going to be doing with the actual product demonstration. To start with, I have a ThinkPad here, it's an i7, pretty strong ThinkPad. Um, and it's going to be running a virtualized environment. This virtualized environment has a primary and secondary terminal server. So it has two terminal servers running simultaneously. Our software, Thin Manager, is actually running on the primary terminal server. For those of you who are not familiar with this, Thin Manager really has two components that run simultaneously. It has the actual engine, which we call Thin Server. That's, that's the engine that talks to the terminals, that gathers information over the network from the terminals and from the terminal servers, and stores information pertaining to configuration of devices. Then there's the interface. We call that Thin Manager. It's the, it's the visual interface from which you drive the entire environment. So if you're going to manage the environment, you use the Thin Manager interface to communicate with the Thin Server engine, right? That Thin Manager in interface does not have to be running on the same box as the Thin Server engine. In fact, you could have another notebook PC and you could connect to it remotely and, and be able to manage your environment. So, I've got the primary and secondary terminal servers here. Now, in my environment, I also have an ESXi server from which I'm going to have uh, another connection or multiple connections made from the terminal to get displays for the terminal. One of the uh, uh, images that's running on this ESXi server is a full-blown terminal server. I call that VHMI03, and I'll use that as part of my VMware uh, demonstration. The other image that's running here is a, an XP image. So we're going to show you how you can actually designate that an XP image running on this ESXi server, its display can actually be brought to the terminal. Now my terminal itself, this is actually what is called an Intel Nook. Um, it's a very affordable, very fast thin client. This particular one is an i3 thin client. Now that's not a common thin client platform, 
Most inclines are going to be based on something like a VIA uh, or perhaps a, a maybe an LX800 type platform. Uh, this particular one is running an extremely fast i3 platform, so it's an extremely fast thin client. This Intel Nook is somewhere around $265 uh, for a unit. Now it has two HDMI outs. I'm going to use one of those HDMI outs to drive this particular screen right here. Since this is a VGA screen, I actually have an HDMI to VGA uh, converter. The second one I'm going to leave blank. I'm not using the second one, but I am going to drive a secondary monitor. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm using a USB to VGA adapter. It's called a display link adapter, and it's going to drive the second monitor actually out of the USB port. That can be 2.0 or 3.0 USB. This device obviously also has a keyboard connected to it. This keyboard has a touch pad on it, so that'll be used as my mouse. And finally, uh, in one of the other USB ports, it has a um, wave uh, trend, or actually this is an RFID's PC prox reader. So in this other port, it has an RFID PC prox reader, and I have here an HID protocol card that I'll use a little bit later on with the term secure functionality and thin manager. Finally, I have an Access M1011 uh, IP camera. So we're going to be using camera and I'll, I'll actually pull some camera images um, and display them on this client. So this is my setup here. Um, finally, I, I guess I should talk about the fact that I do have a router here. This particular router is, uh, has four points on it that I've connected to the terminal, the two servers, and the IP camera. So they're using Ethernet. And it is wireless and I'll use that when I start uh, demonstrating the relevance product with my iPad here. So. Let's take a look at the Thin Manager interface and my setup here. I'm going to switch over my screen for you. And here is my Thin Manager 7.0 interface. And as you can see on the left hand side, as I said, I have this toolbar section. In fact, I'm going to drag it up from the bottom. And you'll see the different segments. I have Thin Manager server. So that's my connection to the Thin server. And then I have terminals. And as you can see here, I actually have four terminals listed, iPad, Operator, X Multi Monitor, and Z Multi Station. Now I'm only going to be using two of these terminals, that would be Operator and iPad, uh, Multi Monitor, Multi Station, I use that for a different demonstration. I have display servers, my primary and secondary, and then I have this VHMI 03, that's going to be my VMware virtualized terminal server, and then I have an IP camera, I call it Access Left, that's this one right over here. If you look under display clients, I have pre-created some terminal server display clients that I'm going to use during my demonstration. I've got a desktop on primary, a desktop on section secondary, then I've got an HMI demo application, I've got a work order application, and then I have some applications I'm going to use with my relevance presentation. And then in the other sections under the display clients, I have camera display clients, shadow display clients, which I'm not going to demonstrate today. I'm not going to do shadows. I actually don't have a second terminal to connect to until I add my iPad in here. But then when we do the iPad, we're going to be talking about relevance. And then I have a workstation template display client, which I actually will use when I do a demonstration of applying a workstation to my terminal over here. So that is the uh, display clients toolbar tab. I have the users tab. In my users environment, I have four different groups maintenance, operator, supervisor, and supply. And then I have users in each one of these groups, one user per group, Manny the maintenance person, Oliver the operator, Steve the supervisor, and Sally the supply person. So I've got these four users. I'm going to use two of them, Manny and Oliver, during my demonstration. Then if you're a relevance user, as I am here, and I've activated relevance in this software, um, I actually have a, a set of locations, and we'll talk about those when we get to the relevance portion of the presentation. And then I have what I call my vCenter servers. Under uh, ESXi, I have listed here in my data center the VHMI 03. That's a terminal server, and I'll use that as part of my VMware presentation. And then VXP, which is a virtualized XP workstation. All right, so let's go back to terminals, and let's take a look at the configuration of my terminal here through the configuration wizard. Now, this is how we set up a standard terminal like this particular nook here. Um, I gave it a name. I called it operator terminal, so it's just operator. I could have put it in a group and inherited properties from a group. I could have copied settings from a previous terminal. I have the ability to select what type of terminal it is. By default, 
Uh, since this particular terminal is what we call a PXE boot terminal, it comes up as a generic make and model. Now, let's talk about PXE boot real quick. There are two different types of terminal technology, something we call thin manager ready, which means we have a BIOS extension image that we put inside the BIOS of the device. When it boots up, it's what we call thin manager enabled or thin manager ready. If you are working with one of our partners who sells thin manager ready hardware, they'll ship it to you, you'll boot it up, and it'll, out of the box, it'll boot up and go looking for the thin manager server. But what if you had, say, 200 Wise or HP or Neoware or iGel thin clients, and you were using their software management tool, and you said, well, what I'd really like to be using is thin manager. Could you do that? Well, yes, actually, you probably can do that. For most thin clients, they will be what we call hardware compatible with Thin Manager. And if they're hardware compatible, that means you can set them in the BIOS to do a network boot or PXE boot. And when you put it in a Thin Manager environment, it'll actually download a firmware over the network connection, PXE, from Thin Manager. And if it's supported, it will run. Now, do we support every different type of device on the market? Do we support every different type of WISE or Neoware or iGel Thin Client? Well, no, but we might support your device. Your particular device might work. And if you've already invested in, say, 200 HP or Dell Thin Clients, and you want to use Thin Manager, all you have to do is install the Thin Manager software and then attempt to boot PXE to the Thin Manager environment. And it may or may not work. If it doesn't work, and you have lots of these clients, we recommend that you give us a call at ACP and say, hey, I've got these clients. I'd like it to work with your firmware, but it doesn't seem to be supported. As I said, a lot of clients are supported. If you want to check ahead of time, just go to www.thinmanager.com, go to the hardware compatibility list, and it'll tell you if your particular make and model number will boot PXE. This particular Intel device, the Note, we didn't do anything special to it. We just ordered it from Intel, and it was capable of PXE booting. You may have PCs that have hard drives and operating systems, and you may say, well, gosh, I don't want to use them as PCs anymore. I'd like to use them as thin clients. For instance, you may have a Lenovo all-in-one touchscreen LCD PC and say, well, I'd like to use that as an ACP-enabled thin client. Could you do that? Yeah, you actually might be able to do that. In fact, we've enabled those devices for many people before by making firmwares available that support those devices. So again, Will your device work out of the box? We're not sure, but it might. You might want to check online at thinmanager.com in the hardware compatibility list. And then if it's not going to work and you really want it to work, give us a call. If you have enough uh, units and we're interested in that business case, then we'll make it work for you. So this is a PXE boot device, the Intel Nook. And so when it shows up in the actual configuration wizard, it shows up as a generic PXE device. Now, Listed down below is a terminal firmware package. I'm going to briefly talk about this. What happens when the device boots is it goes to the thin server and it says, hey, I need my firmware, which is kind of the operating system for the thin client. And the idea is if you're going to get a firmware to work, you may need the most recent firmware because your particular hardware may only be supported by the most recent ACP thin manager firmware. Once you've established a firmware works with your device, you may want that to be the only firmware that that device boots from. Let me give you an example. In a pharmaceutical environment that is 21 CFR certified or requires 21 CFR certification for devices, we often find that our customers want to continue to use an older firmware even if we've released a new one. So currently I'm using for this device firmware 6 even though I'm using Thin Manager 7 and we actually made a new version of the firmware available, the 7.0 version, the package of the firmware, I'm still using 6 because that's what I'm comfortable with or perhaps <clears throat> that's what I certified under 21 CFR uh, uh, 11. That's what I certified to work with my particular device and I always want to use that firmware. Well, I can set the firmware level or the package level and keep it there for all time, okay? So that's what firmware packaging does here. Now I have additional setup configuration through the wizard, like can I replace this device if it ever gets hit by a forklift? As an example, if this were hit by a forklift, it'd take about 60 seconds to replace it with a new device. You'd basically unplug the cables, plug the new device in, 
turn it on and say, hey, that particular nook is no longer online. Uh, do you want to be that one? It would give you a list of configurations. It would show the one that's no longer being used by this terminal. You'd take that configuration. It would boot up and go right to where this terminal was when it was hit by the forklift. About a 60 second conversion from one terminal to another and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do it. You could set a schedule for the terminal, deciding when it's useful. Is it usable between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday? If you come in on Saturday, does it say to you, uh, no, you can't use this terminal on the weekend. You can set that schedule in here. You can also decide whether it's going to be uh, shadowed. Can you interactively shadow it, non-interactively shadow? Do you have to ask the user if you're going to shadow it? In some environments, you're not even allowed to shadow. So um, the next set in here is for um, terminal mode selection. For instance, are you going to enable multiple monitors? This is where we apply the uh, client, display client, or what we call the content to the device. In this case, I'm putting a desktop from the primary terminal server onto this particular device, so I've applied the primary desktop. This is where we set up the screen configurations under what we call terminal interface options. So, for instance, if I have multiple displays going to this terminal simultaneously, how will they show those displays? How will this terminal show the displays? Will it be stacked? Will it be tiled? We'll be on multiple monitors. We'll talk about that later. Um, when we get into relevance, we'll start talking about some of the relevance configuration. Um, you also have the ability to set up a Windows user for the terminal so that when it boots up and starts a session on a terminal server, it can automatically log in for you if you care to have that happen. You can set the resolution up for the device. Particular device we're using here is 1024 by 768, 64K colors at 60 hertz. You can add modules. In this case, we've got two modules on this device currently, the RFID's PC Prox reader, which I showed you before, and a keyboard configuration module. The reason I put the keyboard configuration module on this device is by default, the hardware boots up with the uh, numlock on, and I hate that, so I have the keyboard configuration automatically turn it off. If I wanted to add, say, a touchscreen, I'd simply click on Add. I'd drop down the list of different types of modules. I'd go to touchscreen, and look at this. This is a list of touchscreens that ACP supports with Thin Miniature. And I can tell you right now, nobody else is going to support, in the Thin Client world, nobody else is going to support more touchscreens. So we support Arista, Carol Touch, DMC, Dynapro, eGalax, Elo Graphics, Gunzi, Hampshire, Infra T, MicroTouch, Panjit, Penmount, Touch Control, USB Generic, and Zytronics. So basically more touchscreens than you could ever find anywhere else. Now, let me show you something about, let's, let's pick Elo Graphics for instance. I want to show you how specific we are to the nature of the industry. I'm going to go under the touchscreen and hit configure and I'm going to show you a configuration option here. It's called swap X and Y coordinates. Why would we have that in there? Well, let me tell you, here's why. Because many of our customers have called us and said, you know what, I got this new touchscreen, LCD touchscreen today, and I tried it out and when I went to calibrate it, um, it, well, first off, out of the box, it didn't work at all. It, 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 the mouse was all over the place when I was touching places. And then when I went to calibrate it, I hit the lower left with my finger, and the mouse cursor appeared in the upper right. And when I hit the upper right, it appeared in the lower left. Even though I was calibrating it, it wasn't working. It was 180 degrees off. Why did that happen? Well, the reality of the situation is that whoever manufactured the touchscreen, really what touchscreen companies do is they take like a, a, an Elo Graphics touch pad that it's kind of a screen that lays over top of your LCD monitor and they apply it to the device and it'll have leads on it that'll give the reading from the touch wherever you're touching and, and give it, feed it to the board to the driver for the touch screen on the board and it'll tell you where you're touching and the problem is is that sometimes the boards inside of the monitors that support this, they get turned around 180 degrees and, and mounted differently or the touch interface actually gets mounted differently. And what's happening is the person who's putting the two pieces together finds that the leads work better if you turn it 180 degrees. So they flip the screen cover, 100, the touch screen cover 180 degrees, and then it's physically 180 degrees off. This particular selection here under the module settings or configuration allows you to swap the X and Y coordinates. So instead of sending the touch screen back to the manufacturer to have them rotate that 180 degrees and reapply the touch screen, 
it simply works and it's done through math. Why send it back if all you have to do is say swap X, Y coordinates? That's something we do specifically for the nature of the industry. We get touch screens that are rotated 180 degrees all the time. We want to make it so you don't have to send it back. You can just change the math and make it work. So I'm going to remove this touch screen because it doesn't apply to this device since I don't have a touch screen on it. Hit finish and show you that my configuration through the shadow here has a uh, desktop on the primary server. In fact, I'm going to type hello in my interactive window here. I'm shadowing it. And remember what I said about the tabs, they're now tear away. I'm going to pull it off and tear it away from the interface. And as you can see, it says hello there. I'm going to move it around the screen a little bit. I could pull it off the screen. I could actually um, bring it down here and dock it. So I could dock it up top. I could go to properties and pull that off and dock it up top as well. So I, I've got the ability now to dock these different windows and um, that would actually give me the ability to see multiple things simultaneously in my environment. So um, I'm going to pull the tabs back down to the tab bar and you can change the order of the tabs. By the way, I told you I was going to show you a little bit about how we could uh, change the look of the application. I can actually drop this down and change the look of the application by selecting different looks, black, silver, aqua, see the different looks and then the tabs I can change 3D angled angled wide I actually like the one that says uh, 3D on it so I'll leave that one and I'll change the application to black I like black that's kinda cool so um, this is uh, just some basic thematic changes in the interface now the next thing I want to do is I want to go into this operator configuration right and I want to um, I want to take away the desktop on primary and I want to add the HMI demo. What I'm doing there is I'm changing the content that's going to be delivered to the device. And as you can see, I did that through the wizard. It was very easy. I just went into the wizard, moved forward until I got to those display clients. And I said, okay, I don't want the desktop on the primary anymore. I want the HMI demo application. And I applied that to the terminal. And then to make this configuration hit the terminal, to change the terminal configuration, I just restarted the terminal. Now, as I said before, we have these quick access icons up across the top. Instead of doing the restart by right clicking and restarting, I could have just touched the quick access restart up here and it would have done the same thing. Okay. So now I'm going to slip over to the shadow and you will see I'm going to start this application here that actually gives me an HMI visualization interface. Okay. So I'm going to skip over here and do the HMI visualization interface while I'm getting that started, which it's running right now, I'm going to show you that this HMI demo is actually running on two different servers simultaneously, the primary server and the secondary server. Now, what is that? What's that about? This is what we call instant failover, okay? What this means is, and let me talk about failover first. In a failover environment, what happens is the terminal starts a session on the primary terminal server. You might ask, well, what if the primary terminal server were to fail? You know, maybe the hard drive went bad, or uh, maybe you wanted to turn it off and, and, and change something. Maybe you wanted to change out a piece of equipment on it. Or, or maybe you wanted to change some of the applications that were installed, and you wanted to upgrade the applications or update the operating system, and you didn't want the terminals running on at that point. Well, what you would do is you would, you would bump the terminals off of it and do the update, but what, where would they go if they no longer had the primary server to connect to? Well, in a failover environment, which is something we provide in Thin Manager out of the box. It's just part of the product. In a failover environment, it'll say, well, the primary is no longer available. The terminal will say, I better go to the secondary and start a session and run the application. So basically what you do is you set up a primary and a secondary, and you put the same applications on both. When the primary goes away, the terminal goes to the secondary and starts the same application. So in this case, we have this um, mixing application, mixing HMI that we've created. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that if I turn off or disable this particular ter uh, terminal server, and I can do that through the tools menu up at the top, as you can see my ribbon bar, I've selected tools and said disable. What will happen is the terminal will skip over to the secondary. And you can see as soon as I disabled the primary, it flipped to the secondary. Now, it's the same application. We changed the background color so that you can see the difference between the two. But if you look over on the terminal screen itself, and I'll re-enable the primary, it's going to fail back to the primary. The reason it's failing back is we have something called enforced primary turned on, which says, hey, if you ever see the primary come back, fail back to it. Now, 
Why would you use instant failover or failover? Well, failover says go to the primary or from the primary to the secondary, start the session, run the application. Well, what if that was going to take, <clears throat> I don't know, 40 seconds? And the problem was is that you didn't want your operator to be without the visualization for 40 seconds. Maybe you're in a, uh, um, I don't know, steel plant. And having the operator without the visualization for 40 seconds, that's a total no-no. Well, what you're able to do from this is make it so that it already has the secondary running. So what happens is the terminal starts the session on the primary, starts the session on the secondary, runs the application, hides one behind the other. If the primary goes away, then it's already on the secondary. So it can get there in seconds. And again, I'll show you if I disable the primary, you watch over on the screen, it'll switch right over to the secondary. If I re-enable the primary, then it'll come right back to the primary. Again, what it's saying is, okay, if I go to the secondary when the primary's down and the primary comes back, I want to get things balanced out again. So through enforced primary, it says, let's balance it back out. And, and, and perhaps you have 10 terminals that start from primary and 10 terminals that start and run on secondary. And in, in a nominal mode, it's 10 on each, but then if primary fails, now there's 20 on secondary primary comes back, I really want 10 of those to go back so that we're back to 10 and 10, okay? Um, could you do that another way? Yeah, we actually support load balancing. Um, and the way load balancing works is, is it uses CPU, uh, number of concurrent sessions, and, and uh, memory, and it looks at the terminal service and says, okay, based on those three parameters, what's most available when this next terminal boots, where should I put it based on the, the greatest availability? Which terminal server is most ready to receive another session? So that's a load balancing function. We call it smart session. Again, it's built into the package. You don't pay any extra for failover. You don't pay any extra for instant failover. You don't pay any extra for load balancing, which we call smart sessioning. And you don't pay any different for published applications. This is actually a published application. Uh, how do you know that? Well, you don't see a desktop. It started the application as soon as I connected this session. It brought the, the application to the screen and not the actual desktop to the screen. So, I have this operator terminal now. It's running the HMI demo, as I showed you before, on the primary and secondary. I'm currently connected to the primary because it's up and running. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add back that uh, desktop on primary, hit finish, right click, and restart. This is what we call um, multi-sessioning. This is the ability for a single terminal to simultaneously have connections to two different sessions or could be two different terminal servers running two different sessions. It could be the same terminal running two different sessions. So it can have two different applications running as its content and sent to it simultaneously. Now, when it has two sessions, how are you going to be able to see them with this one monitor? Well, it's already gone into what we call tile mode. By default, I had it set to tile. So it switched into what we call tile mode. And I'm in tile mode now. And you can see both sessions simultaneously. Cool thing about tile mode is I can click on either session, it'll go full screen, okay? And I have a, I have a button set that says if I right click, it'll go back to tile. And obviously, I'm shadowing it here. Um, these are interactive, I could do it on the screen over there. If I'm in <clears throat> this single screen mode and I leave it there for a little while, go back to tile, but if I wanted to switch during the time I was in the mode, I can actually use the drop down menu and switch between the two different sessions very easy to do with the drop down menu. We also have the ability to use the edge of the screen and the mouse, push the mouse up against the edge of the screen, and it's as if it was on a cylinder. So you can have multiple sessions and they, they basically move around like they're on cylinders and you'll see the next one and the next one. And, and when I say next one and next one, how many different sessions can you have simultaneously? Um, you can have as many as you want. Um, how many can you have tiled simultaneously? Five by five, you can have 25 tiled. Okay, so we can have them stacked, we can have them tiled, we can switch between them with drop down, we can switch between them on tiled by clicking on them, or we can use the screen edge group selection. We also have the ability to use a keyboard sequence like control page down and control page up that'll switch between them as well. So we have different ways to get to the different sessions simultaneously. One of the things I want to point out, um, if you were doing say a 5x5 five five and, and 25 simultaneous sessions, it would be like 25 simultaneous applications. That, that's not commonly, you're not going to have that many applications on a terminal. But you may want to use 5x5 five five in the instance where this one terminal is in a control room and it's simultaneously shadowing 25 terminals on the plant floor. So you could actually have 
the shadows, you can be see, seeing what's going on on 25 separate terminals simultaneously from one, this one device and then select any screen and go full screen with it, either interactive or non-interactive. So that's, that's kind of one of the, the situations where this idea of tiling really comes into play is in a control room environment. Now, so we've talked about the tree and the new configuration layout and the ribbon bar and these, you know, quick access to the different segments of the tree. We've shown you the different segments and display servers and display clients. So the servers are our sources of displays. The clients are the configuration of how we gain access to their sessions, to our IP cameras. So that's kind of the configuration of the, of the content. Or we have this user's idea, which I'll get to when I talk about term secure. But let's, let's go back to this terminal. Okay, we've applied a single session or display client to it. We sent a single display. We, de we, we deployed two, so we had both mixing that uh, HMI and we had the desktop. L what, if I, what if I wanted to use both monitors simultaneously? So I wanted to have the content in one of two ways. I either want to take two monitors and stretch my content across the two screens, or I want to use each of the two screens to have different displays on it, different content. In the case of the, the, the tile in here, I have mixing and I have a desktop. Could I apply one of those to each one of the two monitors? Well, let's take a look at how we set this up. Let's go into the operator terminal. And in the configuration, we have an area, area here we call terminal mode. I'm going to enable multi-monitor. Now, by default, it's going to, it's going to say, OK, let's say you may have two, but I could go to three, four, or five. If I had a, a device um, that was what we call ACP-enabled multi-monitor, I would know how many monitors it was capable of. In the case of a PXE device, I really don't know. What I do know is in software, we support up to five simultaneous mo uh, monitors. In my case, obviously, I have physically, I have two monitors here. I'm driving one out of that HDMI to VGA conversion. I'm driving the other out of USB to VGA. So I've got two different monitors here, so I'd set it for two. What if I had four? How could I lay those out? Well, I could go four across left to right or top to bottom, or I could go four in a square. I could have three across the top and one below, or one on the top and three below. Those are my different configurations for four. Well, if I have two, then my configurations are pretty much limited to left to right or top to bottom, and it's pretty obvious here I'm left to right. Okay, so I'm going to use left to right and two monitors. Note also that when I select the two monitors, I can have different uh, resolutions for each of the monitors, different refresh rates, different video ports. Again, this is one of those we're really specific to our industry things. The reason we have different video port settings so you can swap the video ports, a lot of our customers call and say, hey, I just put this multi-monitor into a control room. I had four monitors from one thin client, so it drove four simultaneous monitors. <coughs> and I set it up, and I put it inside my panel, and I hooked in all the cables, and I closed the panels and screwed them back together, and I turned it on, and I found out that monitor one was on the left, yeah, but then monitor three, two, and four came after it, and I really wanted monitor one, two, three, four. So I was getting the wrong stuff on the wrong monitor, Oh, I have to open up the panel and move the cables? Gosh, it'd be so much easier if I could just change the port that the uh, video was coming out of in software. So we gave our users the ability to do that without having to go in and change cabling around. And that just saved them time. And that's one of the things that we do that's very specific to the nature of the use of the product within our industry. So. I'm going to use 1024 by 768 as my resolution for both these by default. The native resolution is 1024 768. A note here that it says use session size limits for. You got two selections in here. Uh, server 2003 or 2008 is one selection, and server 2012 is another. The reason we have that is because uh, server 2012 actually um, allows for greater screen real estate. Um, so we're using 2000, I think 2003 in my connections. So we're going to choose a monitor layout left to right. Then it's going to say, well, what's our screen layout look like? What this means is, am I going to expand my real estate across the monitors or I'm going to use different monitors for different displays? Well, the selections are either I screen across with screen A being across monitors one and two, or I have screen A is monitor one and screen B is monitor two. So I'm going to start out by spanning across two. Okay, so let's move forward and it's going to say, well, what do you want to span across those two monitors? What display content do you want on there? I'm just going to put the desktop, and by default, it used my previous configuration and already had it in there for me. I'm just going to put the desktop in here. 
Now, I'm going to right click and I'm going to restart this terminal, but instead of actually selecting restart, I'm going to go up here to the top in the menu and I'm going to hit reboot. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to do that. Um, in the case of multi-monitor, switching from single monitor to multi-monitor mode, it actually takes an insertion of a driver at the kernel level, the kernel operating system level, which requires a full reboot, reboot of the device, not just a restart of the session, but a reboot of the device. Now, if I had hit restart there, it would have actually gone through the process of trying to figure out what it needed to do to go into multi-monitor mode and said, oh, I got to go full re reboot to insert into the kernel, and it would have done the reboot anyways, so I saved maybe 10 seconds of time by just going ahead and doing the reboot. By the way, you can reboot more than one terminal. If you apply configuration across 10 terminals and want all 10 to reboot at the same time, you can reboot all terminals or you can reboot a group of terminals uh, all simultaneously through one command. So what it's doing right now is it's restarting the whole device, reloading the firmware and putting it into multi-monitor mode and then opening up the real estate from a single monitor to dual monitor. And what that means is if I take this hello world application, I slide it to the center, you're going to see it in the center of two monitors. <clears throat> if I maximize it, it will maximize across both monitors. Now, one thing I want to point out here, if you had, for instance, a visualization application that was written to apply to a dual monitor workstation PC, right, and you had two monitors at 2048 by 768 total resolution, and you applied it in a thin manager environment by installing the application on a terminal server and then running it. Without any change to the visualization application at all, it would work, just like it worked previously. You don't have to make any code changes, you just apply it to this thin manager environment and it'll work perfectly just like it did in your workstation environment. So what I've done is I've increased the real estate. Now what if instead of increasing real estate, I wanted to take each display, and there's, I'm going to use two, and I want to apply different displays to different monitors. I simply slide up the screen layout selector to have monitor one be screen A, monitor two be screen B, and then it'll say, okay, what do you want to apply to each of the two screens? I'll leave desktop primary on screen A, and I'll put uh, HMI demo on screen B. I'll hit finish. I'll right click. I'll restart. Now, it's not going to reboot the terminal because it's already inserted the multi-monitor uh, driver into the kernel. So what it's going to do is just going to restart, and it's going to take the content which is the um, screen A content would be uh, desktop primary and apply it to the first monitor and it's going to take the second piece of content, the HMI demo, and it's going to apply it to the screen B monitor and there you go. So each monitor has different content. Could I have tiled additional content onto the second screen or the first screen? Yes. Can I move content between screens? Yeah, you can actually use the drop-down selector and move content between screens. Can I lock content down to a screen so you can't move it? Yes. Can I protect content on the screen so that, say, I had my HMI demo uh, or HMI on the left-hand side and I didn't want anything to come over top of it because I always want my operator to see my HMI? Yes, I can do that as well. So there's a lot of different ways to handle it in this multi-monitor environment. You can stack content to multiple monitors. You can tile content to multiple One of the things that we see all the time in our environments um, is that customers use this product <clears throat> in control room environments. And they use multiple monitors. In fact, I have a customer I just saw about three months ago that's using many of the uh, multi-monitor thin clients in this single control room. And they use a four-way uh, terminal so they can drive four models, monitors simultaneously. They'll usually use pretty big monitors. And then they'll split the screen with tiling so that they can see all of the terminals in their environment. They have a very large environment, two miles end-to-end. -end. They've got terminals all over it, and they want to see in the control room what's going on in the environment. So what they'll do is they'll split the monitors right with tiling and put four or nine different displays simultaneously on these big monitors and then they'll have multiple monitors. So a single terminal, multi-monitor with multi-tiled multi sessions in each one of the monitors. So let's say you were using four monitors and two by two tiling in each one. You'd have 16 simultaneous shadows of terminals in the plant or combination of shadows and other sessions that you were running in the control room. So you can run terminal server sessions and shadows simultaneously all from the same terminal on four different monitors or five if you choose or three or whatever you want to set in a single control room and drive it with a single keyboard or mouse. In fact, this particular customer actually has um, 
three terminals left to right, each one with four monitors, each one tiled in each of the monitors, and they're using the same keyboard and mouse from the center terminal in both the right-hand and left-hand side terminals. We, we call that shared keyboard and mouse. Now, actually finding the mouse at any given time, they actually use the mouse finder in Windows that gives you a little drawdown that shows you, hey, this is where the mouse is, and they size the mouse up. Because sometimes it's hard to find when you've got uh, you know, 12 different monitors, and it could be in any one of the monitors on any one of four different tiles. But it is a really good way to use a single piece of hardware to drive an entire control room and a single keyboard and single mouse so the single user can get across all of that. Okay, so again, I've now done multi-monitor. I want to move on um, from multi-monitor and add a camera in this installation. So I'm going to go to my operator terminal, and I'm actually going to disable multi-monitor and put it back in single monitor mode. And I'm going to go back to the desktop on primary, hit finish, right click and restart, and then start talking to you about this uh, camera over here. So I have what's called an IP camera over here. It does what's called multi-JPEG, which means it takes multiple JPEG images and stacks them up and sends them to you. And then you see them in quick succession, which gives you video. Um, similar to what you'd get when you were a little kid and you'd draw little stick figures on, on the corners of your paper and you'd leaf through it and you know, your little stick figure would move. Well, that's similar to what happens here. This particular camera is set by default to give me a 4-3 aspect ratio image at 640 by 480 resolution. So it's actually taking a 640-480 video image. It's pointing down here to the ground where we have some, um, some billboards up here that we're going to show you in a moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the content, so this is the source, I'm going to take the content from the camera and I'm going to apply it as a display client, as a display to this terminal. And I'm going to apply the camera image to this terminal. And there's many different ways I can do this. Um, the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a full screen image of the camera to the full screen of that terminal. I'm only using the left hand monitor at this point, so it'll apply to the left hand monitor. Now let me show you how the configuration is set up. I'm going to go into my display, display client section under cameras and add a camera display client. I'm going to call it full screen, right? And then it's going to ask me a couple of questions here. Don't worry about those, but it's going to, it's going to ask me how do I want to lay this camera onto the screen, basically. And we call this screen here a camera canvas. So it's that big blue area you're seeing in your screen right now under the configuration wizard. And there's going to be ways that we can add those cameras in to that space. And what we're going to use is, is what's called an overlay. And there's ways we can set up the overlay. Um, I'm going to start with the easiest way, which is a one by one, which means I'm going to use the full area of the canvas. So whatever the size of the camera is, in my uh, configuration here, it's 1024 by 768. I'm going to use the full area. Now, that's not the only way I could apply a camera. And, and I'm not limited to one camera on this canvas. I could actually go one by two and have two cameras, one on top, one on bottom, or two by one, all the way up to four by four and have 16 simultaneous camera images fed into this one area, which we call the canvas, right? So I can create a multi-camera overlay, okay? But again, I'm just going to do a one by one, and then I'm going to move forward, and it's going to say, okay, so I'll default name it overlay one, and I'm going to put it at 0, 0, and width and height are going to be 10, 24, 7, 68. Now, what cameras do you want to put in there? Okay, now, if I select a camera and I put it in an overlay, and then I apply it, I'm going to get that camera in the overlay. If I say, just give me all the cameras in the overlay, I'm going to get the first camera in the list in the overlay, and then I can interactively click on that area of the overlay and select a new camera so I can switch between cameras or I can cycle between cameras. So I could have 10 cameras I've selected to apply the overlay, and then every five seconds or every four seconds, I can have it change the camera. I can actually have it give me a title. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna just select the one camera I have, access left, and I'm gonna apply it to this full screen area. Now remember, the raw image from the camera is 640 by 480, and the area of my screen is 1024, 768. Oddly enough, I'm not going to fill the whole screen with this unless I go to overlay options and I select scale. Okay? So in the overlay options, I have enabling or disabling, making the camera interactive or the overlay interactive, scaling, cropping, showing the camera name, giving it a border size, giving it a title position, title size, and then cycling. Obviously, I can't select cycling because I only have one camera. Wouldn't be much to cycle through. So I've selected the access left camera. And I have not scaled it. Note I haven't scaled it. And I'm going to hit finish, okay? 
Then I'm going to go to the terminal, and I've created this new display client, and, and instead of having the desktop primary as the only thing on here, I'm actually going to add to that this full scheme camera that now appears in my display client list because I created a new configuration all right, from my source, which is the camera, and I've said, from my source, I want the whole camera image, I want to place it in the center of the screen and fill it up, but I'm not going to scale it, so what will happen is it will put a 644-80 image in a 1024-768 screen and put black around it. And I've applied that to my terminal, and I'm going to right-click and restart the terminal, which now it receives its new configuration that says, okay, I want the desktop, but I'm in a multi-session mode, and I also want the camera image, right, full screen. So what it's going to do is it's going to tile those two, and I'm going to see them both on the screen. On the left-hand side, I'll have the desktop. On the right-hand side, I'll have that camera image, but I'll have black around it because it's 64480. If I click on that tile, it'll go full screen. If I click on the camera image, it'll ask me if I want to go full screen with the camera, meaning scale that image from 64480 to 1024, fill the area. If I had a selected scale in that overlay options, it would have done this for me. But what I'm doing is doing it interactively, okay? And then if I hit restore, it'll take it back. If I right click, it'll go back to tile mode. If I left click on hello world on the desktop, I can get that back. And again, this is all interactive, right? All right, so that is a camera image that's brought to a one by one or full screen. What if I wanted a custom size and location of the camera? And what if I wanted to lay it over top of an application that was running. So I had like a visualization application and I left a blank area in the visualization application and I wanted to put the camera inside that blank area, right? Could I do that? Well, yeah, let me show you. I'm not gonna do it with visualization. I'll just do it with a, a, a notebook or uh, notepad application. So let's go to terminal services applications and add a new one called notepad, okay, with camera. Okay, so it's in the notepad application with a camera and see right here in the second screen it says include IP camera overlay. I'll check that. And then I'll move forward and it'll say I'm going to run a remote desktop application. I'm going to link it so it doesn't run a desktop but it asks me what app I want to run off the primary terminal server. If I had added secondary it would have gone into failover mode and it was started from primary and failed to secondary. The application I want to run is notepad.exe. I don't need the path because it's in the Windows path. I don't need command line options. I don't need a folder to start in. You can put those if you want, but in my case, I'm, I'm not going to require those. Then when I'm done with the linked application information, it's to say, okay, where do you want the camera to appear over top of this application? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, what's called a custom overlay. I could have created a custom overlay on the, on the camera canvas, but what I'm doing now is putting the overlay on top of an application. And I'll just call this OVL1, and it'll say, where do I want it? Well, I'll put it at 400 by 400, and I'll do it at a size of 320 by 240. And, and you'll see on this representation where it'll appear, kind of down a little bit right of center, okay, on the 1024-768 screen. It'll then say, okay, this overlay that you want, what camera do you want inside it? And I'll put the access left camera. If I put multiple cameras, I could cycle or select them interactively, but I'm just one camera. And then I'm gonna scale it down from its raw image, which is 644.80, down to 320.240. So it'll scale in nicely and fit. What, what if I had an odd shaped aspect ratio overlay, like it was wide and not so tall? Well, what it would do is, similar to how your television takes a 4-3 image on a 16-9 television, so you got a widescreen, it takes that 4-3 signal and it puts it in, then it puts ESPN on either side or whatever. <laughs> Ours doesn't put ESPN on either side. It'll put black on either side, right? So it'll scale it in if I scale it and put black on either side. If I don't scale it, it'll crop out from the center. Always crops from the center in a thin manager environment with IP cameras. So I've added the access left camera over top of this application. I'm going to go to my terminal. I'm going to add this notepad with camera application, hit finish, right click, restart, say yes, and guess what? We're going to go into a two by two tile mode now because I now have three. So upper left will be the desktop. Upper right will be that full screen camera image with the black around it, obviously. Lower left will now be notepad, right, with a camera image, 320 by 240, uh, kind of down and a little bit to the right. So there it is, down and a little bit to the right, my live camera image, and note that I'm in Notepad, okay, still. So I'm interactively typing in the application. So if this were your visualization 
you'd see all the buttons and all this stuff going on, right? But you'd have a camera there. Can you make the camera go away while you're inside the application? Yes, if your application is an ActiveX control container, like just about every uh, HMI application, for instance, or like Visual Basic or anything like that, you can actually use the scripting, drop the ActiveX control that we give you. Again, it's part of the software, just as camera support is part of the software, just as tiling is part of the software, just as multi-session and smart session and failover, all part. The actual uh, ActiveX control ships in the software install, and you can apply that ActiveX control in your visualization and use just a few lines of scripting to activate the control, to select the overlay and camera image, to change the camera, to change the size, to change the scaling, to make it disappear, to make it reappear. You can actually read in information about what user's logged in and know, okay, if this user's logged in, then I want to see the camera. If this other user's logged in, then I don't want to see the camera. I could change the buttons, I could do whatever I want at that point. So we do have an API that allows you to talk into the Thin Manager system and very easily through scripting get to those functions and do things like turn the camera on and off. Now, obviously while I was talking there, it went back into tiled mode, okay? And that's perfectly right because it has a, about a 60 second, maybe 30 second, 60 second, I don't know what the default I set on here is, delay at which point if you haven't moved the mouse and you've gone to that full screen version, it says, well, you're not really looking just at the full screen anymore. You're not moving the mouse. You're not interactive with it. You know what? Let's put it back into tiled. If you want to go back interactive, then you just simply click on it. When you're done, you right click to go back. Okay, so now I've applied a camera. Let's talk about applying a user. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this operator terminal and I'm going to take away uh, desktop and full screen and notepad with camera and add back the HMI demo. Hit finish, right click, restart, say yes. Now, I've just taken away content and I've gone back to the HMI demo content because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about adding a user to this environment. So, just so you understand, we're going to have a presentation here that includes mobility. I haven't gotten to the mobility part. We're still talking about thin client management. I'm doing all this demonstration from the aspect of thin client management, the new visualization interface, talking about 7.0, but I've taken you back in time to show you all the content, all the capabilities of Thin Manager, because I want you to understand the Thin Manager platform first, and then we'll get into this relevance technology. So here we are with our operator, right? And let's, let's take this operator screen to what we call boilers. So here we go into the boiler environment, okay? And I've got a boiler here and I have an operator who's operating from this visualization interface. So I got one terminal here running. I'll turn off this other screen so it doesn't bother you. But we got one terminal running here for Oliver the operator. And Oliver manages the boiler room. So his function occurs inside the boiler room. And here's the thing. If I had an issue with the boiler, let's say this feed valve for the gas, V6, is not feeding, it's kind of flaky, appropriately, and so my gas is kind of, yeah, it's coming up, it's coming down, whatever. It's causing the temperature to fluctuate, which is causing the temperature and pressure to fluctuate, which puts me in an area where my boiler function may get either too hot or too cold or too much pressure or too little pressure, and it falls outside of its dead band, at which point it will alarm, and I perhaps will lose the process, and that's a bad thing. It may take me two days to get the process back up. So Oliver is a smart enough guy as an operator to recognize this is fluctuating a little too much. I need to call Manny in maintenance and have Manny come out and look at this. Now, Oliver's probably smart enough to know it's maybe a valve issue, but he, he's not going to replace the valve. He's not going to order the valve. It's not part of his, his function to do that. Probably doesn't know how to do it. He's not a maintenance person. So he calls Manny and Manny comes out and says, well, gosh, you're probably right. So we're going to tag all this off, close that process off, Keep the pressure up, but I got to get this thing fixed quickly. And here's the deal. If I'm going to fix this valve, I'm going to have to order a part, right, with my work order system. I'm going to have to order that part and then go pick it up in the parts department. And my job is to get this done quickly. Maybe the maintenance area where I work is a golf cart drive away, and it takes me 10 minutes to get from end to end. I've been in plenty of plants that were two miles long, and the maintenance could be at one end, and this issue could be at the other end of the plant. Well, if I'm going to have to drive 10 minutes there to order this part, I'm going to be wasting time I could be using to get it fixed. Right, so what I want to do as Manny, the maintenance person, is I want to use what we call term secure. 
And the idea behind term secure is Manny has content assigned to him. Just as this terminal has content assigned to it for the boiler room because the terminal is tethered down in the boiler room and its screen is right there in the boiler room and Oliver's in the boiler room and that's where Oliver and this terminal work, right? The content assigned to this is always there, always available, but Manny has content like the work order system that he may need in the boiler room, but then again, he may need it at the other side of the plant in some completely different area to fix some completely different problem. What I want is the ability to have Manny have content that's assigned to him and that content accessible anywhere Manny is so Manny doesn't have to go all the way back to the maintenance area to get on his computer or his thin client to get to the work order system. So Manny has in, in, in our environment what we call a configuration, a term secure configuration that allows him to have his own content. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under users and show you Manny and through this wizard, I'm going to show you his configuration. So Manny is a user in TermSecure with a TermSecure password. This is not the Windows username password, it's completely different. You can have groups of users, you can copy content from a, another user so that if you have similar users, you can just copy the configuration. You can have a badge, like an HID protocol badge, assigned to Manny so that he can scan in and scan out with an HID protocol reader. You can have content assigned to Manny. In this case, Manny inherited content from the, work or, or from the maintenance group that he belongs to, and it is the work order application that he inherited. You can have a username and password assigned to Manny, right, within this environment. Now, the reason you'd have a username and password is because if you have content that Manny owns, and you have to go to a terminal server to get to that content, you're going to have to log into the terminal server, and the user that you log in with has got to have access to that application, right? Well, there's four different ways that I can give that login information to the system to allow Manny to get access to the content. Number one is I could just leave it blank and say, well, Manny logs in as a term secure user and then logs into Windows once it gets to the Windows connection. The problem is Manny has to have two usernames, two passwords that he rem remembers and enters. That's, that's kind of a pain and could be hard for Manny to do. I could actually, when I log in at this terminal over here, I could take the terminal's auto login information and pass it in if it auto logs in, and then the terminal logs in for Manny, but the problem is that the terminal may not have access to Manny's applications because Manny could log in from any terminal. It could be in the boiler room, it could be in the shipping room, it could be, and the terminal may not have the relative, you know, access, the authentication required to get to Manny's applications. I could pass Manny's term secure username and password in, but then I'd have to keep them synchronized, Windows and term secure. I'd have to keep the usernames and passwords synchronized, and that could be difficult. Rather, what you should always do is what we call username and password obfuscation. This is where the administrator of the term secure environment under Thin Manager gives Manny a Windows username and password that Manny doesn't even know. It's entered in for him. In this case, it's user one. I don't know what the password is, but it's user one. And Manny doesn't know that username and password, thus can't go to another Windows environment and try to log in with it and gain access to things he shouldn't get to, right? And it's obfuscated from him, so it doesn't need to change very often because it's an administered username and password that he's not seen, so he doesn't know what it is to even change it. Okay, so obfuscation, that's an RSA security me measure. You would actually pay extra for, but it comes as part of Term Secure, which comes as part of Thin Manager XLI licensing. So if you buy 7.0 XLI or you've had any previous version that has Term Secure in it, like 6.0 XLI or 5.0 XLI, it was part of it. You got it as part of the product. You got our RSA security measure called username and password obfuscation. Note also that you got another RSA security measure here called uh, always prompt for password when you have a, a uh, uh, HID protocol card, for instance. If you were to drop it, well, couldn't somebody just pick it up and use it to scan in? Well, not if you prompt them for a password. That's what's called multi-factor authentication, right? So you got to have something you have plus something you know. If you don't have the something you have, then obviously you can't get in. If you don't have the something you know, you can't get in. You got to have both. So if Manny were to drop that HID protocol card and somebody picked it up, they wouldn't be able to get in unless they knew his passcode as well. So again, multi-factor authentication. Okay, once Manny logs in, um, Manny also has different settings um, and that would apply over top of what the terminal has. For instance, maybe Manny doesn't like to go into tiling mode. So when he authenticates to the device, he doesn't go into tiling mode. So let me show you how this works really. In fact, I'm going to go in here and look at the terminal on my shadow so you can see it clearly on the screen. 
And what I'll do is I'm going to go in and, and uh, pretend that now it's time. I'm out at the boiler room with Oliver. Now it's time to order this part because I've got to fix it and I want to do it quickly. So I'll hit Control and M for menu and then say login. Type my name, Manny, and my password and it will apply the content that I have configured under Term Secure for Manny, which he inherited from the, work or, or from the uh, maintenance group, which is the work order system. So it applies the work order system. Manny orders the part. Note also that if I hit control page down, the boiler content is still there. So it, at, additive to the boiler content, it added Manny's content because Manny may need to get back to the boiler visualization, right? And look at things and then switch back over to enter a work order to order that part, right? And then when he's done, he says control M and hits log out and the content goes away. So it's one terminal now useful for both the operator, Oliver, and the maintenance person, Manny, rather than Manny going all the way back to the maintenance shop. Okay, so what if I wanted to apply a card to Manny? Well, the first thing I would do is I'd get a card that was not assigned to anybody and I would scan it in my environment and the administrator or thin manager would get a screen that says assign card number to existing user and I would pick out of the list of existing users, users under maintenance, Manny, hit finish and it would now have been assigned to Manny. So I've now got this card that's assigned to Manny and then when Manny goes out he simply swipes the card and it applies the content. So now I've got the content for the work order system on there. I enter my work order there at the terminal in the boiler room. When I'm done, I swipe out. Wherever this is swiped, it applies Manny's content. As long as the terminal is authorized for use by the maintenance people or by Manny himself. So you can control whether or not Manny can access certain terminals and not access other ones. But I'd simply swipe in, gain my content, swipe out, my content goes away. If I were to forget to log out and go to another terminal and swipe it, it would log me out there and bring the content over to the new terminal. So my content would basically follow me. All right, so that's adding the user to the environment. The final thing I want to do as a demonstration is talk about VMware, and there's two things I want to do with VMware. Many times people will have an application and they'll tell us, well, it only works in an XP environment. So it's an older application, I can you only use it in XP environment. So your choices are you either get an XP workstation box, a full-blown PC with workstation installed, and put it on the plant floor, it means the hard drives on the plant floor, likely to fail, and make it work with your application installed locally, or you put an XP box in the engineering or IT department, and then you remote into the XP box because XP supports that kind of terminal services where you do remote administration. You could remote in with the terminal. That was for a long time the only way really you could support XP on the plant floor. And it was going to either cost you having a full-blown PC that's likely to fail on the plant floor or having a full-blown PC in some office environment and then remotely connecting it with the terminal. So now I got a terminal and a PC. Wouldn't it be better if we could just create virtualized images and for, say, 20 terminals that needed XP, have 20 images all running from the same VMware ESXi server? Well, let me show you how that works. So we've got these VMware ESXi servers here, um, images. Um, we have a single server with two images, VHMIO3 and VXP. That's a virtualized occurrence of XP. I could have 20 of those on this single server right here. Single physical piece of hardware many images running XP, supporting this older application that runs only under XP. Then I can apply that XP occurrence to a terminal. Let me show you how that's done in Thin Manager. I go to Client Displays, I'll roll that up, go to Workstation, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an XP template. I'll just call it XPT. This is just a template interface that gives me the ability to set things like including the IP camera, linking an application, etc. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to take the default XP template. Then I'm going to go into the terminals area. I'm going to go under operator and in the wizard I'm going to drop off the HMI demo content and put the XP template. And when I move forward it's going to say, okay, do you have a physical XP box you want to steal the screen from or do you have a virtual image and you want the, the screen image to come to this terminal? I have a virtual image. It's going to show me my SXI server and my virtual image. I simply add it. 
And then I move forward through the remainder of the configuration options. I've already got those configured. And I restart the terminal to apply this. So now, rather than running a terminal server session on a full-blown terminal server, it's going to run from the image that's running on this VMware ESXi box. This VMware ESXi box has an XP image. It's going to take that image display and bring it to the screen, and you're going to see XP. And just to make it so that you can see, it is actually running paint in this case. I'll kill off paint, not save it, show you that I could run, uh, well, I can run paint again. That'll clear the screen and I'll draw again. So you can see this is a full-blown XP environment and it's running here for the terminal over there. This means you can run your XP application and create the destination as the terminal. And you can put it out to 20 different terminals, have 20 image running for the 20 terminals and only one physical piece of hardware that you have to maintain. Good reason to use virtualization in your environment. Let me give you another really good reason to use virtualization. So, I'm going to go to my operator terminal. I'm going to start a session on my virtualized terminal server called VHMIO3 and restart it. Okay, so it's going to now start a session. Now, here's the deal. Let me set the stage. I'm Matt. I work in this environment where I am on the plant floor. I am the person that manages all the visualization. And I have a virtualized server, right, running under VMware uh, ESXi. And I've created for 20 uh, users, 20 operators in my environment, I've created this visualization uh, tool, if you will. I wrote the code. It's very complex. Um, it has a big red button and a process bar. And it helps us run the entire plant. And it works really good. My, my boss loves me. Um, so it's... Let's say it's 7.30 in the morning on a Tuesday. So 7.30 on Tuesday, and my 20 users at 7.30 are out there. They're operators. They're all using this big button to run the process, and it's working great. But my boss, I don't know what his name is, Fred. My boss had a bad night. Bad night. And he comes in, and he sees these 20 terminals, and he says, ah, I hate that red button. I want it to be green. So he comes to me, Matt, and says, Matt, um, okay, I want you to make that button green. Now, it's 7.30 in the morning, he's asking me this, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll do the work during the day, then I'll come in at 8 o'clock at night when there's a shift change. Um, we're going to go off shift at 8, and we're not going to bring the people back in until 8 in the morning. So we have this, this period of time, a maintenance period, where we could, 12 hours where I could install the application, apply it to all 20 of the different terminals, and feel very comfortable about rolling this out. And at 7.30 in the morning, when my boss asked me this, um, we actually have this window um, where it goes from 7.30 to 8, and we have a shift change at 8, and then at 8.30, we start back up with the new shift. So I don't really want to use that hour. That's not enough. I'm uncomfortable making a change as small as even as, you know, a green button, because it is a visualization interface, and if something goes badly wrong, I could have problems. So I tell my boss, here's what I'll do. I'll make the change today. And then I'll roll it out this evening, test it, make sure it works between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. the next day when nobody's working and we're not, we're not running the process. And my boss says, no, I want it by the time shift change is over at 8.30. Oh, really? I, I still think that's a good idea. He says, I don't care. Like I said, yeah, bad night. So he says, no, 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 I want it done now. What do I do? Well, here's what I do. I go under my VMware server section in Thin Manager, okay? I right click on the virtualized terminal server, right, that I'm running these 20 different terminals from right now, and I do a snapshot. I take a snapshot and I call it uh, BKME for back me, okay? And this checkbox is already checked, but I'm going to include the virtual machine memory image. And I say yes, and what's going to kick off here is a process under the tasks that is creating a snapshot of the entire virtualized terminal server, even while the terminal clients, like this operator terminal, are currently running. So I got my 20 users at 7.30. Shift change doesn't start until 8. They're using the application while I'm taking a snapshot. Now, I'm going to go ahead and change the, the button to green while this is happening on my development version, because at 8 o'clock, when they leave the terminals, I want to roll it out. 
but I'm creating this snapshot in case I have a problem, right? Because if I have a problem, I only have 30 minutes to get it fixed, and that's not a lot of time. So if you go back to the VMware vCenter server and you look at the ESXi server here, you'll see that my status is now uh, 65, 66% complete. This image is just slightly short of 20 gig. If you were going to create an image to run a visualization in your plant for 20 users, it's probably not going to be much bigger than that. Now, I'm running a notebook computer as my ESXi server. If, if you're running the plant, you're likely to have a, a very high-end server running this. It's going to have a faster drive. It's going to have more processing power, and it's going to happen even faster than this. But for my 20 gig image, and, and as you add stuff into a VMware environment, the VMware image grows, right? So my 20 gig image could support a pretty large uh, install of visualization. My 20 gig image is currently done. It's, it's completely created a snapshot on this notebook ESXi. So to say that two minutes is what I took, maybe yours takes 10, you can still get a snapshot of the entire environment pretty quickly. And what I can do now is I could go back to my terminals and I can shadow or I could go out on the floor and I can kill the application that's running. So it's going to reconnect to its shadow here in a second and I will kill the application as it's running by hitting my little kill button and then I'm going to run my new application with the green button on all 20 of my terminals. So here we go, I'll run that application, put it on the terminals, ha, thank goodness, it's 810, everything is cool, 20 minutes, shift change happens and oh my goodness, a bunch of these started failing. What am I going to do? I only have 20 minutes and people are going to be back at their locations in their operating environment trying to use the visualization tool and it's going to have a blue screen on it. What do I do? Well, here's what I do. These terminals are still trying to connect to a live session. I simply go to VMware vCenter here, connection, right click and say snapshot, revert to current, which is the most recent snapshot, which is the one I just took. And these terminals will recognize that there is a rollback to a previous snapshot. So they're going to be on the red button or on the green button, which has failed, and then they're going to fail back over as soon as they recognize that the previous snapshot is back in place. And in the span of just minutes, all 20 that have failed are now back operational. I go back to my boss and I say, look, I tried to do that. I tried to make it green, but something went wrong and I rolled back. I'll take care of it tonight, please. Okay, so that's VMware virtualization within Thin Manager. Obviously, you can see that in our environment in Thin Manager, we've taken some of the VMware uh, management features and rolled them directly in. So you can do things like uh, start or stop your image, suspend your image, reset your image, take a snapshot, manage snapshots, revert to snapshots, rename, remove from inventory, or delete. That's not obviously all the functions. If you're going to create a VMware image, you would do that in VMware vSphere. But once you've done that, we have the ability to manage those from within Thin Manager, all the way to doing, for instance, scheduled snapshots. We, pro we, we provide for scheduling snapshots so that every night at one o'clock you can take a snapshot of your visualization systems, et cetera. Um, and that's something that makes it much easier to maintain uh, without going outside to a bunch of different applications.